It's wonderful to be with you again and to share again. Um, that comment about liking, like, liking undergraduate education, um, I had to make, I think I mentioned this before that I made a choice not to go to a conference in Florida because I would come here instead, you know, and the weather of course is that, uh, the first thing that comes to mind. But the main reason, the main reason why I turned down that conference in Florida, because that would just be talking with other academics and I greatly prefer talking with undergraduate students, so it was a no-brainer for me to come here. We can get the, the first slide up, fantastic. So today we're going to think a little bit along these lines of the Christian tradition of loving God with heart, with soul, and with mind. And the thoughts I have to share are not particularly profound, but just call us to remember that this is a long-standing tradition within Christian thinking, that Christians have always had this appreciation right back to the beginning of looking at nature and understanding that if nature is God's creation, then a study and an appreciation of that nature is is a very appropriate thing for Christians to do, and that it can be an act of worship. So just a couple of texts, just to orient ourselves at the beginning, that this is a long-standing Christian perspective. We've got Paul there in Romans 1 talking about how creation speaks to us about God. And then another quote that I like, I like this one particularly, I show this to my students when I'm teaching them about fruit flies, and maybe they don't want to learn about little tiny fruit flies. But, you know, if your heart is right, I say to them, if your heart is right, then this too is a book of holy learning to you. This is Thomas Akempis, um, wrote a very well-known and translated book called Of the Imitation of Christ that you may have heard of. So this sort of sets the stage for us to think that we're part of a long Christian tradition. We are not the first to worship God, to look at creation, and to try to put those two things together. So we can go to the next slide. This is, um, I actually thought I'd have this in front of me with my laptop, but that's okay. Um, this is a quote from Augustine, and it's a long quote. There's a lot to read there. And it just makes the point that, I think I made the point earlier in, in yesterday's talk how this can be a really a missional thing for Christians. That if the world outside sort of sees that maybe a Christian is saying something about the natural world, that seems in conflict with what they know from reason and experience, that this could end up being a missional barrier. As a, you know, and Augustine, this, Augustine articulated this. If we go to the next slide, we'll see where this comes from. This is from his commentary on the literal meaning of Genesis that he wrote about the year 415. And he's saying, you know, if, if, uh, if outsiders know certain things and hold certain things to be true from their experience and their reason, then if they hear a Christian sort of holding forth on these topics, but they're, they're in error, then how are these people going to believe us when we talk about the resurrection, when we talk about eternal life and the life of the kingdom, if they think as part of the package comes along these things that are in conflict with what they know by reason and experience. So this missional concern that I expressed yesterday is, is also a longstanding concern within Christianity. So Augustine is giving us some insight into the relationship of science and faith, even back in his time. And he's actually implying that, you know, implicit in his argument is that to be a Christian means that you have a desire and a knowledge to study the natural world and to be knowledgeable about it. So he's actually, there's a motivation for science, as we would call it now, even back at that time. So. The interesting thing too here is that he's putting a very high value on reason and experience. He's not saying the way to figure out about the natural world is to look at scripture. He's actually saying no, the appropriate way, the appropriate God-honoring way to learn about creation is through reason and experience. That there's this idea that we can use these God-given tools as a way to explore creation. And of course he's got this strong missional concern that I've been speaking about. He wants to make sure that Christians aren't somehow presenting erroneous ideas in the context of packaging that along with Christian faith. Now, the interesting thing, of course, is that the science that Augustine is working with at that time is very different from the science that we have now. So what he would have said is sort of common knowledge for outsiders to know about uh, is very different with what we would say now. And we actually have a, a culture now that is much more scientifically literate than the culture that Augustine would have been living in. So if anything, this call for 
this absence of sort of a conflict would be even more imperative for us now because we live in such a scientifically literate culture. Okay. So Augustine's squarely within this long-standing Christian tradition, and it's something that has been there from the beginning. It continues now. And later on, this view, I don't really have time to develop it today, but this view that creation has a creator behind it, and that because of that, we expect creation to be logical and understandable and studyable, that is a major motivator for the scientific revolution later on in Christian Europe. There's, that's a major driver for the idea that we can study creation because it has this creator behind it. Okay, so here's that quote from Thomas Akempis again, just to sort of underscore this point. In the, this is in the 1400s. So during the Middle Ages, this theme continues. This is a, something that we see as a continual theme throughout Christianity. And here, of course, the science of the day, this is sort of pre-scientific revolution. So if you think about what sort of understanding that Thomas Akempis has of science, it would be very small compared to what we have now. But he's saying, if your heart is in the right place, you can see from creation, and you can understand from creation things about the Creator, very similar to what Paul has said. Here's uh, another example um, from around the same time. This is actually St. Francis of Assisi. And this is the text of um, a poem that he wrote. Now, he didn't write it in English, of course. He wrote it in a dialect of Italian. But it's called The Canticle of the Sun. And we're actually going to sing a song later that is an English translation and adaptation and paraphrase of this. And we know it as the hymn, All Creatures of Our God and King. Now, one thing I'll need to just flag up for you is the word creature here. That meaning has shifted a little bit over time. So creature, we now sort of use that almost exclusively to talk about living things. But in Assisi's day, and actually also in Thomas Akempis' day, when he's saying every creature to you, no matter how small or lowly, is a book of God's learning, he's actually saying all of creation. You'll notice in the Canticle of the Sun, uh, St. Francis is talking about the sun and the moon and the stars as creatures, as creations of God, and that we can join with them in praising him. All right. Now, lest you think that this is a tr tradition that died out in the Middle Ages, that is certainly not the case. This is a tradition that continues today. And some of you may be familiar with some Christians who are in the sciences and who are unapologetic about their Christian motivation for science and the fact that they see um, God's beauty and wisdom in creation. Um, the director of the National Institutes of Health in the United States, for example, Francis Collins, would be an example of a Christian who follows in that tradition of praising God for what he's finding in creation. Uh, this individual, who is also um, a friend and a colleague of mine, is um, Dr. Jennifer Wiseman. Um, she is the lead uh, uh, government scientist on the Hubble Space Telescope project. And she is an unapologetic evangelical Christian. So another example of somebody in the present day who is, like the other day I saw on Facebook, somebody made this comment about scientists, and it was a well-meaning Christian, I assume, making this comment and saying, you know, the trouble with scientists is that they never give, you know, they're so pr the implication was they're kind of proud. You know, they go out and they study things about creation, but they never return praise to God for what they find. You know, the sort of idea that scientists are kind of atheists and kind of try to deny God. And, you know, it's never a good idea to respond on Facebook, but I'm like, yeah, okay, I got a comment. <laughs> and what I said is, you know, actually that's not, that's simply not the case. I know of a number of, I know many scientists who in their work as they discover things about creation, they return praise to God for what they're discovering, that God has given them the, us the ability to research and to study his creation, and that there's nothing to fear about science. As we learn more about creation, we actually naturally incorporate that into our worship. And that's another theme that we see all the way through Christian tradition. As we learn more about creation, we naturally take that knowledge and we integrate it into our worship and no exception with the work that Dr. Wiseman and colleagues have done. So if we go to the next slide. This is um, a very famous photograph. You've probably seen it before. It's called the Hubble Deep Field. 
So one of the things that they did with the Hubble telescope, they've actually done it a number of times now, is they've actually just pointed it at a particular spot of dark space and they've pointed it at a specific spot of dark st space for many, many days and integrated those images. So it's an extremely long exposure of this tiny, tiny little piece of space. This image field is about the amount of space that if you took like a, like a very small pebble and held it at arm's length, it would be about that much space that you're looking at. And what they were surprised, like when they first did this experiment, they weren't really sure what they were going to see. Because, you know, will we be able to see anything out there? It's just this dark little bit of space. And when this image came back and they processed it and, review, and it revealed what they were seeing, they, scientists were amazed. Because what you're actually looking at here are individual galaxies in that tiny little slice of space. So these aren't, for the most part, these aren't stars. There's a few stars in the field of view that are in our own galaxy, the Milky Way. But most of what you're seeing here are individual galaxies. Now, you think about that. You're holding that little pebble at arm's length. That's how many galaxies are in that little tiny slice of sky. And we've looked in a couple of other spots since then and done larger surveys. And as far as we can tell, this pattern holds across the entire sky. There's this many galaxies out there. And you can get an idea of some of them. You know, there's spiral galaxies, there's globular galaxies all sorts of things. Now, think about Francis of Assisi and his Canticle of the Sun, right? He's worshiping God for what he can see, sun and moon and stars, and he's saying, you know, join with me in praising our Creator. But think about his vision, right, based on what he knows scientifically at that time. It's a, it's a smaller vision of what we have now. If you could have shown him this image, it would have completely blown him away. He wouldn't have understood what he's looking at, but if you'd explained it to him, Think about what he would have written in that canticle if he had had this vision. But now we do, thanks to people like Dr. Wiseman and others working with her, we have this vision. So what do Christians naturally do? We take this information and we return praise to God because of it. So instead of the canticle of the sun, where we're talking sun, moon, and lights of evening, now we're going to start singing things like God of Wonders beyond our galaxy, right? We're naturally incorporating that into our worship. Go ahead and put the next slide. So Christians naturally, this is just what we do. As we learn more about the natural world, it's natural for us to take that information and return to praise to God for it. And our praise, as it becomes more informed by science, we actually have more and more that we know about that we can praise God for. Now, is there stuff that we don't know about now that maybe in 20 or 30 years we will be praising God for? Absolutely. I talk to my colleagues in physics, there's lots of sort of unresolved questions that are out there and we don't know how certain things work. But as we learn stuff, we naturally incorporate it into our worship. So we've got the Canticle of the Sun, 1200s or so. At that time, uh, Francis of Assisi, like everyone around him, would have assumed a geocentric cosmos with the Earth at the center, not moving, the sun going around it, and the stars not very far away. The idea that these fixed stars are just in a sphere that's not very far away from Earth. Then you can think about discoveries since then, like the Hubble and whatnot, and what do we see in response with Christians? We start to see songs like, you know, God of Wonders, which is this other song that we'll sing today, where not only are we, you know, we're beyond that little sphere, and now we're looking out in space, we're looking into the, into deep, the deep past, and we're praising God for all of those galaxies out there. And we're saying, not only praise for that little bit that we know about, now we know about more, and we're offering praise. You might be familiar with the um, Hillsong song, uh, So Will I, 100 Billion Times. I think I mentioned it last, last time. This is not a song that I know how to sing and lead well yet, so we're not going to sing it today. It's a beautiful song. It really goes away from this trend of modern worship choruses being really repetitive. It's not repetitive, it's just this big long hymn from creation to new creation. And it has this line in it. I, I told my students, you know, sooner or later you're gonna see a worship song that has the word evolution in it. I didn't think it would show up this quickly, but here it is. In this line, there's praise given to God that creatures are responding to his call for them to evolve as they should. Go ahead with the next line. 
So, you know, here's Canticle of the Sun, what would Francis of Assisi, you know, how much more he would have praised if he had seen, had that larger vision that we now have. The next slide. God of wonders, you know, beyond our galaxy, you're holy. The universe declares your majesty. We've gone from that small universe that Assisi knew about, Francis of Assisi knew about, and now we've gone to this much larger universe that we know about. Now, the question then becomes, what do we not know about now? What will we be praising God for in the future as we learn more? And then in the next slide, here's some lines from this song, uh, from the Hillsong song, 100 billion times. And even that, that word, you know, 100 billion times, you know, that is talking about time scales. It's alluding to processes that take place over a really long span of time and saying all of this is part of God's plan and part of God's design for how the cosmos is put together. So we see lines like this, you know, if the stars are made to worship, so will I. You know, if the rocks cry out in silence, so will I. If it all reveals your nature, so will I. And of course, that one line that some churches have decided to sort of edit out or change, right? Because they're not maybe necessarily comfortable with this yet. But this idea that creatures are evolving in pursuit of God's decree. Now, it's perfectly natural for Christians, once they discover something about the natural world, that if they accept it, it's perfectly natural for them to incorporate that into their worship. And I think, honestly, that this is the trajectory that the church will take as more and more individuals within the, within the church become convinced that evolution is a reliable description of, ha of one of God's creative mechanisms that will start to see this incorporated into worship songs. All right, next slide. So it would be very strange to give you an academic talk about worship through the centuries and then just sort of say, okay, now we're done. We're, as believers, it makes much, much more sense for us to actually take the time to not only think about these things academically, but also to respond to God in praise. So the two songs that we're gonna sing, and I promise like you're gonna get the amateur hour here. I'm, I'm a biologist, not a musician. Some of the people up here are professional musicians, but I'm not. So if, we, if I flub a little bit, that's okay. The point is to praise God. And we're gonna sing two songs. Um, the, the worship team can start coming up and getting settled in as I do this. The first song, of course, is All Creatures Ever God and King. So this is the English adaptation and paraphrase of Assisi's famous Canticle of the Sun that we're familiar with. And then, of course, the other one is God of Wonders. So what I want you to think about as we're worshiping God together is just how our perspective has changed over our history and how the more we learn about creation, the more reasons we have to praise God for it. So I'll ask you to stand as we sing. And then this will be the, the close of our service.